Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Ribas. I'm a uh, medical oncologist at UCLA and I'm a professor of medicine. Whenever we try to turn on an immune, an immune response to cancer, uh, the immune system cells that have the capacity to kill the cancer cells have to be activated, uh, usually by a vaccine or by cytokines. And then they travel around the body and they look for the cells that they have been licensed to kill. Now we know that the cancer, uh, many cancers, uh, try to shield themselves from these killer cells, from these killer immune cells, by expressing a protein called PDL1 or the ligand of PD1 receptor. Uh, the PD1 receptor is in the immune cells uh, that are exposed to an antigen and the ligand turns them off. So the cancer is using something that biology has developed and our evolution has developed to limit inflammation and it uses it uh, to hide itself from an immune attack. So the, the clinical development of PD-1 and PD-L1 antibodies has gone quite rapidly in the last year and a half to two years. Uh, there's now six PD-1 or PD-L1 in, uh, blocking reagents in the clinic from different companies. The two first ones brought to the clinic were from Bristol Myers, one to the, to the receptor, to the PD-1 receptor, one to the PD-1 ligand. There's already been uh, two papers from the phase one trials of both of these antibodies that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. Uh, telling us the excitement about, uh, about these targets because the two first tries in the clinic already make it to the top ranked uh, uh, medical journal. Shortly after that, there's the drug development by Merck with MK3475, which is a PD-1 antibody uh, inhibitor. There's also been drug development by a company from Israel called Curatech in collaboration with Teva. There's a PDL1 antibody from Genentech, uh, which I hear is going to be reported in the next several meetings, both at ACR and ASCO. And uh, there's a, um, I forgot the last one, but there's other ones in the clinic. And probably the ones, the programs I don't know about are from other companies that are bringing this forward. The, the papers uh, uh, from uh, Suzanne Topalian in the New England Journal of Medicine reporting the phase one uh, the early phase one data from the, with the PD-1 antibody from uh, uh, Bristol Myers, which is now called nivolumab, showed that in groups of over a hundred patients with melanoma and lung cancer, that and, and kidney cancer, that in these three indications they there had reproducible and durable tumor responses. The highest ones were in melanoma and kidney cancer, where approximately 30% of patients in this phase one dose escalation trial, where we usually don't see that many uh, uh, responses, but uh, because many patients are treated at suboptimal levels. Well, here, even at the low levels of drug exposure, there were durable responses around one third of the patients. Uh, the, the reported follow-up of one and a half to two years with the majority of patients who had a first response continuing to be in response. The, the results in lung cancer, in non-small cell lung cancer, were a little bit lower in around 20% objective response rate. But I think this is outstanding. It's probably the first time that we hear of any immunotherapy strategy having reproducible activity in non-small cell lung cancer. This was data with the PD-1 receptor antibody. If we look at the PD-1 uh, ligand data, uh, there was a little bit lower response rate with a melanoma being around 20% and also in kidney cancer. The toxicities were a little bit different also, which is not surprising by the mechanism of action of both the receptor and the ligand. The PD-1 can bind to both PD-L1 and PD-L2. So when you block PD-1, you have a broader effect. When you, uh, when you block PD-L1, it's mostly the target in the tumor because PD-L2 is expressed by other cells of the immune system and usually not by cancer cells. So blocking PD-1 had uh, a little bit more toxicities, uh, the most important one being uh, pneumonitis or inflammation in the lung, which was not evident when blocking the ligand. But overall, 
the safety profile of both the PD-1 receptor ant antibodies and the PDL1 receptor antibodies, uh, PDL1 to the ligand like antibodies, are quite manageable with serious uh, adverse effects in less than 10% of the patients. The majority manageable by, uh, by uh, stopping the treatment or skipping some doses or in some extreme cases requiring uh, 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 immune suppressive therapy with corticosteroids. So here we talked about a biology where it's a receptor to ligand interaction with the ligand being expressed in the tumor tissue, sometimes by tumor cells, sometimes by macrophages or some other stromal cells in the tumor. So it's very logical to think that if, there's, if the ligand is there, then the immune system cells that we're trying to activate may be turned off by the ligand. So it, that may be a way of select patients and get even higher response rates. This is a testable hypothesis, and the majority of the programs that I know of are trying to pursue this and developing diagnostic tests to look for the PDL1 in the tumor environment. But I don't think it's going to be a straightforward testing uh, to be implemented. There are several reasons for it. One, the PDL1 or the ligand, uh, it's an inducible protein in many cases where uh, molecules that are released by the immune system, in particular interferons, can upregulate the ligand. So if there's no immune response at baseline, there may be, not be ligand expressed. But if you induce an immune response, then the ligand may be expressed afterward just because the immune system cells, the lymphocytes that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, colonize the tumor, may trigger its expression. So a negative testing at baseline may not preclude having uh, an, an important effect of the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction uh, uh, afterwards. Also, there's questions about how do we define a positive and a negative uh, a test, a positive or negative sample. So we're talking about an inducible protein that is on, that has to be on the cell surface, not intracellular, because the, only in the cell surface will engage with the receptor. And that is usually a patchy expression in the areas where the tumor is interacting with the immune system. So if we have a tumor that's 90% negative, but it's 10% positive, maybe that should be called a positive tumor, but I don't know. The other way around, if we have uh, uh, just 1% of positivity, is that enough to call a positive? Maybe not. Maybe that should be a negative uh, 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 result. So it's probably going to be. Uh, we're, uh, it's probably going to take some time until we know can we select patients based on on the expression of the PDL1 or the ligand in the tumor, uh, because we'll have to follow patients who were tested positive or negative or indeterminate, which I would assume there's going to be quite a bit in between because it's hard to think that it's a dichotomous uh, kind of result. And that may take a while until we follow those patients and see what happens, how many of the negatives respond and how many of the positives don't respond. So we, uh, we have the trials open uh, with the Merck PD-1 antibody, so it's to the receptor. Uh, we have, uh, we participated in the phase one trial of this, uh, of this antibody, and that phase one trial has proceeded uh, uh, for patients with melanoma and lung cancer, and we're actively accruing to both cohorts, and we're, we're getting patients from many places far away uh, self-referring for this study. Uh, we are, the, uh, after this, it will need to go to licensing programs, and unfortunately, that will be randomized trials where half of the patients will receive uh, the PD-1 antibody and the other half will, give, uh, will receive a standard of care therapy, either chemotherapy uh, or in one of the studies it will be pilimumab or the CTLA-4 blocking antibody. But the, the first trial that we have with this uh, uh, randomized design or, or, or allocation in the two arms has a crossover so the patients who are on the control arm can still get the PD-1 antibody afterwards. I think next ASCO is going to be, uh, 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 um, there's going to be a lot of data presented with PD-1 and PDL one antibodies, and we'll have updates with the studies uh, from Bristol-Myers, both with the ligand and the receptor, 
There's also already studies combining uh, uh, the PD-1 antibody, nivolumab, with epilimumab, or the CTLA-4 blocking antibody that's commercialized with the name of Yerboy, that's approved for patients with metastatic melanoma, and I eagerly uh, uh, await uh, those, uh, seeing those results. We'll see a big body of data from the Merck program with several hundred patients treated uh, in the tail of the phase one, and I will look uh, forward to that data. We should see data from the, the Genentech PDL one um, uh, uh, GSK also has a PDL1 construct. It's not an antibody; it's a solubilized uh, ligand. That we should, uh, I would assume, we should see some data. So I think it's going to be an exciting time for this uh, pathway uh, 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 with with data being presented. That's going to be highly relevant.